Welcome everyone to the Decision Making Voices from the Field Leadership Series Seminar. This seminar is sponsored by the Division of Policy, Translation, and Leadership Development. My name is Miguel Marino and I am a Yerby Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of Biostatistics. It is my pleasure today to welcome our guest, Dr. Julie Gerberding. Dr. Gerberding is currently the president of Merck Vaccines, a position she began in January of 2010. Her responsibilities at Merck are many, including the planning of new vaccines and accelerating efforts to broaden access of Merck vaccines in developing countries. Dr. Gerberding is an alum of Case Western Reserve University, where she received her undergraduate and medical degree. She completed her residency in internal medicine and fellowship in clinical pharmacology and infectious diseases at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Gerberding has also received her Master's of Public Health at the University of California, Berkeley, and she is an adjunct associate professor of medicine in, the, uh, in infectious diseases at the University of California at San Francisco. Dr. Gerberding is formerly the CDC director from 2002 to 2009. At the CDC, she was responsible for coordinating initiatives for public health crises such as anthrax bioterrorism, SARS, and H1N1 influenza. She also advised governments around the world on urgent public health issues such as AIDS, chronic diseases, and obesity. Dr. Gerberding has received more than 50 awards and honors, including the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Distinguished Service Award for her leadership in response to anthrax bioterrorism and the September 11th attacks. She was named by Forbes magazine 100 Most Powerful Women in every year from 2005 to 2008, and was named Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World in 2004. We are eager to hear from Dr. Gerberding as she addresses crises, crossroads, and credibility. I will now turn the seminar over to our moderator for today, Dr. Lenny Marcus. Thank you, Miguel, and welcome, Julie. Thank you. Well, we very, very much appreciate your coming to the Harvard School of Public Health to share with us some of your thinking on leadership and your experience on leadership. Um, your experience has been extraordinary from leadership in academic um, institutions to leadership in the government, now to leadership in the private sector. And personally, it's particularly wonderful to welcome you here because we've been, the two of us, engaged in a dialogue on leadership that goes back um, to 2002, 2003 when you first came up to Harvard to help us inaugurate the National Preparedness Leadership Initiative. And I remember uh, in that dialogue early on, uh, talking about public health and leadership, uh, one of the two of us, and I forget who, said that bad leadership is a public health risk factor, just like smoking uh, or violence can be a public health risk factor. Bad leadership can be a public health risk factor. And when Katrina happened, we were emailing back and forth, and we said, I guess we were right. And I think there's been a quest uh, for you in your work to be very deliberate and thoughtful about your leadership and very deliberate and thoughtful about the leadership of other people. So my question to you is, over the course of this incredible career, what have been some of the key leadership lessons that you've learned? Well, that's a very challenging question, Lenny, but I can try to give you a short answer by just saying that um, I really have continued to evolve my concept of leadership and have tried to frame it in a way that works for me inside of myself, but also in a way that helps me think about organizational leadership. And I talk about it in terms of the four Ds. Um, first of all, there's destination, knowing where you're going. There's development, which means that you have to continuously learn and evolve as you go. There's the concept of discipline, making sure that you prioritize and execute on what you're trying to do. And, and just to take that one a little bit further, I think that discipline is probably the aspect of leadership that we need the most work on. It's easy to have a vision and a goal. It's not so easy to have the focused discipline to be able to execute on it. And when we go back to that conversation we had about Katrina, I think we saw what happens when you don't have the kind of effective discipline that you really need. But the fourth D is the one that actually is the most important overall, I think, and that's the whole concept of determination. Um, and by that I mean the ability to motivate people, 
to understand passion and how to harness that passion in the direction that the organization needs to go, to engage people's hearts, not just their brains or their pocketbooks in the steps that need to be taken, and to be sure that you're respecting and leveraging that determination on the way forward. Now let me go back just to say a, a, a little bit more about destination because everyone's been in organizations that have done strategic planning and you have a mission and a vision and you have a goal. Those are very important things and you can argue forever about what's a goal and a, an objective and a strategy. But what I think is the most important aspect of that destination is your strategic intent. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean your ability to describe in terms that everybody can understand where it is that you want to end up. So what is the future state that you are trying to get to so that that intention is really clear? And it turns out to do that in a concise and, and meaningful way is one of the hardest things a leader has to do. I work very hard on it and I still haven't mastered the capacity to really um, help people see here's where we are now, this is where we need to go, this is how we're going to get there, these are the things that we must do if we're going to be successful, and this is why it will matter and be better for everyone when we arrive. If everyone understands that intent, the leader's job is a lot easier because you don't have to micromanage the process of getting there. Everyone will understand what their contribution to that destination can be, and then they will be able to make their own decisions, use their own expertise and their own capabilities of moving them forward. And also say another word about development, because um, one of the things that happened after the anthrax attacks at CDC under Jim Hughes' leadership, who was the director of the National Center for Infectious Disease at the time, was we recognized that CDC had done some things very well, we had done some things not so well, and we needed to really step back and learn. And Jim had people come in from all sectors. We had people come in from the media. We had people come in from law enforcement and the FBI. We had public health leaders, hospital officials, government leaders. We pretty much brought in groups of people who had a stake in our performance and had a perspective on our performance so that we could learn. What did we do well? What do we need to improve? What advice do you have for us? And it was really that learning that set the framework for the commitment that CDC made to a preparedness agenda and actually how we ended up with Harvard and the Kennedy School and the School of Public Health in supporting the Leadership Institute because we recognized that that leadership learning was missing at the CDC but across government when we failed to really be able to collaborate effectively together. So those four Ds are things that I use to frame my leadership environment when I'm in an organizational setting. But recently I've also learned about myself that I use the same approach to my own internal leadership, mm -hmm. leadership of myself. Mm -hmm. So I haven't spent a year in my life since I was four years old without a goal. I've always known when I was four and forward that I wanted to be a physician. Mm -hmm. And that worked for a while, and then, you know, when I achieved that goal, I had to invent some new ones. But I always need to know where I'm going. If I get up in the morning and I don't know what my goal is for the future, I'm disorganized. I can't prioritize. I can't figure out what direction I need to take and what's really important. Um, the concept of development. You know, I'm, I'm an infectious disease doctor, and I believe that people are like bacteria. Um, you know, that bacteria grow 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. They grow logarithmically. And, you know, once they stop doing that, that means they've run out of nutrients. You know what happens after that? They die. So if you want to continue to thrive in life, you have to stay in log phase. And that means you have to learn and grow and you have to nurture yourself and you have to keep learning and feeding your curiosity and your imagination and trying new things. and. So that development concept is something I take very personally. Um, discipline is not my strength, um, but it is something that I work on because I do enjoy so many things that prioritizing my time and, and making sure that I'm disciplined in the way I execute on my goals is sometimes uh, a little bit harder than it should be. So that's the area that I, I really work on the most. And the determination has never been a problem for me. I, I live and work and enjoy my family and my life from a position of great passion. Um, that is the thing that gives me the energy to do some of the things that I aspire to do and, 
um, that determination is, is something that I tried to infect my niece and my, uh, my mentees and the people around me with that same sense of we can do this. It's really going to be hard, but we can do this because it's important, we care about it, and we'll figure out a way or we'll innovate a way to make it happen. So that's, that's in a nutshell how I think about the leadership framework for the organizations that I serve as well as for myself. Well, we're soon going to go to questions from our students. And as a faculty member, I get one question. Okay. So, um, get a short one. It's a short one, and it's an easy one. Didn't you just ask me? I question? got two questions. <laughs> that was the introductory question. You know, I think, um, and having observed you as a leader in many different settings, that you are a role model for other people. Uh, and many times you're a mentor for other people um, as a leader. And part of that is a real commitment to nurturing the leadership of those with whom you're working. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's this notion of how to develop leaders um, is uh, still remains a puzzle for those of us who spend a lot of time on this. Do you, do you create role models? Do you, what do you teach? Um, um, how do you evaluate leaders? And I just wonder, uh, because I know that this is something that you think about a lot and something that you're very, very committed to. I'm very committed to it, and I certainly don't have the answers in every respect. But one starting point that I do try to um, say to anyone who will listen is that we are all leaders. So everyone in this room is a leader. And think about it, when you go home and you're in your communities, um, people know you're a student at the Harvard School of Public Health. So if you were to go into the drugstore and buy some toothpaste, someone's probably watching you because they will think you have secret knowledge about what's the healthiest toothpaste in the drugstore. And I say that facetiously, but I also think there's a deep meaning in it that you're influencing people, you're leading people whether you intend to or not, just by who you are, the affiliation that you have with the School of Public Health, the kinds of choices and decisions you make in your life. So that's role modeling or walking your talk in the broadest dimension of that. And I, I think we underestimate how critically important that kind of leadership really is. Um, they're like viruses going out in the community and infecting people with ideas and behavior and norms that really could have a powerful health impact. Um, on a more formal basis, um, you know, leadership development is one part didactic, and we probably do underestimate the skills that leadership requires. You know yourself from your meta-leadership curriculum that there are many dimensions and it takes a lot of work and we're not always conscious about what skills are really the most valuable ones in the different situations that we face. But there's also the mentoring process. And I like to distinguish mentoring from sponsorship because both are important. Mentoring is a kind of a collaborative engagement where you're um, as in a more of a horizontal relationship trying to understand what does this person need, what are their aspirations, how can I support them, listen to them, um, help them think through and problem solve a little bit. Whereas sponsorship is how can I really accelerate this person's visibility and experience in a direct way. I've had both mentors and sponsors and they're both very very important but often aspiring leaders of the future understand that mentorship is important and you should have many mentors but what they don't get is sponsorship mm -hmm. so mentorship is necessary but I don't think it's sufficient and we as people who are in more senior positions uh, we really have a responsibility to try to be sponsors and find the most talented enthusiastic passionate people and figure out ways for them to present the poster or deliver the introduction of the speaker or uh, represent a position or a perspective at an important meeting. That really helps people have a chance to get noticed and to develop their own skills and confidence and it helps people around them say, oh I saw that person at that meeting. That person is very interesting, very talented. Let's call her back for the next time. Well, thank you. So now we're opening the floor, and um, we have microphones. So when you um, ask your question, if you could just tell us who you are and what department you're with. So do we have any questions? Here we go, our first question. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Shanice Chris, and I'm with the Department of Society, Human Development, and Health, second-year doctoral student. So my question is, 
back in 2002 through 2004, I had the opportunity to be at CDC when I was a student getting my master's degree. And I would see you on television giving different talks. And I want to know, what's the difference between the leadership you give to the internal working audience versus the public? Because I got a chance to see a little <laughs> bit of both. Of both, yeah. Well, um, in most of the time that I was involved in the media, it was a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so I was pretty much practicing the art and science of emergency risk communication. It was not a skill set that I necessarily had, and it was a skill set I had to learn very fast on the job. So depending on when you saw me, I may have been worse or better <laughs> at, that, at that activity. Um, but I, I do think that, generally speaking, as health professionals, when we are in the media, we're translators. And I observe that scientists are critically important as a source of information, but not all scientists can effectively translate that information into messages and meaning that non-scientists understand. And so I had in my head the job when I was speaking to the public was to be the best translator that I could and to help take that very complicated science going on behind the scenes and present it in ways where people could not only balance it with their fears or their current situation and experience, but would also have some confidence that there was an action that they could take or that they were getting credible, helpful information that they could trust or that there was an end in sight and whatever crisis we were dealing with was in good hands and that at the end of the day it would all turn out okay. So I, I think the difference fundamentally is inside. You can be an expert or communicate in your own um, terminology, in your own domain, but when you're speaking with the public, you have to be respectful that it's your job to make information appropriate and approachable to those who don't have that same um, compartment of expertise. And it's hard. I didn't do it well all the time, I can assure you of that, but it was a, it was a particular challenge for me because actually I'm very introverted. And so, you know, it's not that easy to be introverted when there's a room full of cameras. <laughs> so it takes a lot of energy. Well, I have to ask just the one question. In the middle of the night, you get a call. It's from someone who's a CDC director in another country, and they just had some sort of an unexplained biological attack. They want you to give them some advice. How do they go in tomorrow morning, organize how they think about this problem, and respond? What would you tell them? Well, there are two aspects of this. One is how do you manage your organization and manage the overall response? And the second is how do you talk about it, who do you tell, and how do you frame it? Um, both of those start with situation awareness. So the most important thing is to get as much fact on the table as you can, as quickly as you can get it, um, but to be satisfied if you only have 80%. Because in an emergency, 80% is good enough if you're willing to acknowledge that and prepare people for the fact that you will learn as you go. So inside the organization, what do we know today? What do we need to know today? What decisions do we need to make today? And when do those decisions need to be made by whom? That's the internal prioritization. The external prioritization is, is pretty much the same thing. Here's the situation. This is what we know. This is what we don't know. And this is what we're going to do about it. But the one overarching um, message that I think we in government learn over and over again is it's far more important to say what you know than it is to be right and wait until you've dotted every I and crossed every T. Because in this world of speedy media that you know better than I do, um, you, if you wait, you won't be first and someone else will carry the message and chances are pretty good they won't have it right. So above all, um, get out there first with the credible information that you do have. And it's okay to say, we don't know everything today. Here's what we're doing. When we know more, we'll tell you more. That requires the discipline as well. It does require discipline, that's <laughs> right. And, and, and to get outside of your own sense of um, insecurity or lack of confidence because you don't have all the answers. It's really hard for experts and it's very hard for politicians to say, I wish I had an answer to that today, but I don't. But here's what we're doing to try to get you that information as quickly as we can. 
Um, that, that kind of just candid telling the truth is not something that necessarily comes naturally. And I remember the first time I was in a hearing and somebody asked me a question, I said, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that. I'll try to get the answer to you when I can, but I don't have it. And I saw my, my staff were sitting behind me writing notes like, oh my goodness, you never say you don't know. Pass it forward and get her some <laughs> <laughs> But it was the truth. I didn't know. Um, and, and I would rather say I didn't know than to try to bluff my way through it. So. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, over here. Yes, yeah. please. Uh, hi, thanks for, for coming. My name's Matt, and I'm an MPH student on the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics. Yes. In it, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, in addition, I'm I, I'm also taking a, a a class through the Center for Public Health Leadership, and one of the things that we've been discussing, or one of the one of the first things that was discussed, was whether leaders are made or whether they're born, and it's something that's come come up many times in my life. And um, I like the rubric that you discussed about the four Ds, one of which was development. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the specific things that you do to, to develop your leadership, to get into that log phase, um, whether they're activities or practice or what it is that you do. That's, um, that's something I still work on, um, that development. Um, leaders need to be open to learning um, from the people around them that are close in as well as the people who are further out. And no matter how collaborative you are, or how nice you try to be, people hardly ever give you the truth in those domains because it's just not that comfortable to tell the person that you work for or around, you know, you do a pretty good job with this, but you need to work on that. So if you want to try to get that kind of candid feedback, you have to use other strategies. Um, one of the best pieces of advice I got from someone who is the CEO, former owner and CEO of Home Depot, a man named Bernie Marcus, it's very, um, a a very grand supporter of the CDC. Um, when I told Bernie that I was going to work at Merck, I asked if he could give me some mentoring and some advice, and he said, the most important piece of advice I can give you is go to the store, um, because the only thing that will ever make its way to the floor on which you will be working is hot air. So if you really want to know what's going on in your organization, you really want to get candid feedback about how you're doing, you have to get out where people are interacting and where the results that you're trying to achieve are going on. So at Merck, that means patients, customers, um, the people who are using our products or aren't using them because they can't get them or can't afford them. At CDC, that meant public health departments and citizens who were either enjoying or not enjoying our web. And you know all that feedback kind of makes its way back to the leader because ultimately, if we're not fulfilling people's needs and expectations, then we're not doing the job and I'm accountable for that. The other kinds of more formal ways of getting personal leadership feed feedback, you know, 360 evaluations and um, anonymous surveys and I, every time I have my quarterly meetings with the broad team of senior leaders, I try to say to each one of them, now what I'd like you to do is tell me what you need from me and how can I help you be successful and then I write those things down and I use it as a check sheet for myself as I go forward to see, am I remembering this? Have I really tried to take action on it? Um, and I read a lot. My Kindle is full of, you know, the management and leadership library of the world. So if anyone wants to borrow my Kindle, <laughs> you're, you're welcome to do that. I'll, uh, Jeff Bezos would not like me saying that. I was sharing my, my Kindle literature. But um, I, th I think there is a didactic element to it and a lot of self-education. I don't usually find anything off the shelf that I suddenly look at and say, this is it, this is the solution to leadership improvement or development, but I get a lot of ideas and I kind of take one from this perspective and one from that perspective and weave them together in something that makes sense in the context of what I'm trying to do. And when I make a mistake, I try to own it, you know, I try to own it and say, you know, I messed up. I remember one time I was on um, Wolf Blitzer, and we had done, oh, it was we had the flu vaccine shortage when the Chiron uh, flu vaccine couldn't be produced one year because they had a quality issue. And everyone was upset because we only had half as much vaccine as we thought we were going to have, and we had to prioritize the older people. 
And um, Wolf asked me, well, Dr. Gerberding, who's responsible for this? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, actually, I think I am. I wish I had, I knew we had vulnerability in vaccine supply. I wish I'd spoken up. I wish I'd made this a higher priority, you know, and, and I'm sorry that we're in this situation. And he did exactly what the experts say would happen, which is he rescued me. He said, there you go again, Dr. Gerberding stepping up to the plate and taking responsibility for something that's gone wrong, you know, in, in a very positive way, acknowledged that I wasn't afraid to say it was my accountability and I wish I'd done some things differently. So that kind of willingness to admit that you messed up or that you made a mistake or that you have a lot to learn, I think that makes it a little bit easier to learn and stay in that phase. You're not afraid of it. Um, but that is not to say that it doesn't hurt sometimes, you know. There, there are some really hurtful things. The things that you think you do really well, when someone tells you you don't, that's the worst. Because <laughs> then you're like, oh, no, I thought I did that well, but <laughs> what do I do well? It gets confusing. And just to pick up on the born, you, you, br you brought a lot of experience from your Midwest roots into your leadership as well. Well, you know, um, I grew up in a town of 822 people in, in, in South Dakota, and you're really dependent on your community. Um, you, you, there's no lone wolf in, in that world. If we didn't have a lot of interdependence, we wouldn't make it through the winter, or w when the river flooded, you know, people would drown. It was just essential. I always laugh and say, you know, we, we had terrible blizzards and terrible power outages and tornadoes and floods and ice storms. We never called FEMA. <laughs> so, <laughs> we handled it. And that's kind of the Midwestern pride. But um, more, more, on a more personal level, I grew up in a, in a family that really um, valued education and really valued the work ethic. My father was um, very clear that I could do anything in the world that I wanted to do if I was willing to work on it. And they never stood in my way of that. Um, never discouraged me, but they also didn't do it for me. And I think that that sense of competence, that the ability to um, take advantage of the tools and support my parents gave me, but also, um, you know, venturing out of Esteline, South Dakota into a much bigger world wasn't the easiest thing I ever did. And um, that, that kind of self-confidence that I can do this, I can well, I thought I was going east. It was Cleveland, but it, <laughs> it was east. It was Everything a big city. Relative, right? It's all relative. <laughs> it, was a, it was a wonderful educational experience. And the same thing really happened to me when I was an undergraduate. I was lucky to have fantastic mentors, professors, and deans at the school who really took me under their wing and challenged me in severe directions that I wasn't experienced in. But I really had a chance to be a student leader and to grow and thrive in that environment. Just got confident. You know, so yeah, it's, it's a it's a lifelong thing. I'm not done yet, by the way. So, <laughs> uh, other, yes. Uh, my name is Joan. I'm a first year doctor student in nutrition and epidemiology. Uh, my question is, why do you make your move your career from government to industry, and how do you make this transition? Thank you. Thank you. I'm surprised to be working in the private sector, actually. Um, I really expected to return to UCSF, where I'm still in the faculty there, and I still go back every year and take care of patients at San Francisco General Hospital. So I was really looking forward to eventually landing back in you know, the place that I love. I am a doctor. No matter what, I will always be a doctor. Um, so it's kind of surprising that I am where I am. And the journey was um, indirect, but the fact that caused me to make this decision was that I really do believe that vaccines are the <laughs> single most powerful tool in medicine for affecting human health and saving lives on a global basis. And there's a huge amount of unmet need. We're not reaching people with what we have, and we haven't developed the vaccines that would really address some of the most important infectious disease problems. And Merck has a long history of being a pioneer in vaccine development. Um, Maurice Hilleman is our um, icon. He was the man who developed many of the pediatric vaccines that are used today. I believe he probably would have had a Nobel Prize if he didn't work for a, a private company. Um, I mean, he was, such a, he was such a heroic man that when his daughter got mumps, he swabbed her throat, took that 
strain of virus to Merck or to his lab and started passing it in cells to try to create a mumps vaccine. So today, if you're vaccinated with the Mer Merck mumps product, you're vaccinated with the Geraldine strain. His <laughs> daughter's name was Geraldine. So, you know, it's a, it's an iconic um, part of the DNA of Merck, the whole vaccine enterprise. And so um, I'm pretty passionate about global health and I really felt like the experience that I had in CDC and the uh, incredibly successful immunization programs that CDC has created and supported in the U.S., but also on a global basis, that Merck could do a lot to enhance and augment that capability and that the kind of partnership that we need to really accelerate vaccine access was um, a core part of, of what Merck stood for. So I was really attracted by the history of the company's engagement in public health, um, but also the idea that we could do more and should do more, and I, I thought I could have an impact by helping to support that. And I. And I'm glad I made the choice. It's challenging. Vaccine is a much harder uh, world than I recognized in terms of how they're made and the regulatory environment. But you know, I still get to go out and see the people who need them the most and how grateful people are when they can get a vaccine or when their, children is pro when their child is protected. So it, it has meaning for me on a personal level. It was not as hard as I thought it would be, um, maybe because I am in vaccines. Um, there are a lot of people from CDC who work at Merck vaccines, and there is the same kind of passion for science and the same kind of passion for public health. So in a sense, it feels kind of like a very academic um, environment. And I don't know enough about the whole company or the whole pharmaceutical industry to know if that's common or unique to the vaccine area, but I certainly feel comfortable there. And the scientists that I work with in my new role are as passionate and as smart as the scientists that I worked with in my old role, so it feels pretty comfortable. Yes. Hi, I'm Vanessa. I'm a first-year master's student in the Department of Environmental Health, and I'm sharing your Midwest pride. I grew up in North Dakota. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. those cold winters, and you don't yes. call FEMA either. Absolutely. <laughs> no. Um, what I'm wondering, as, as someone who identifies as an introvert, what are some of the strategies that, that you've relied on to make sure that you're an effective, dynamic leader? I'm not there yet. And I, I will, if people who are closest to me know um, that what might look like an effortless conversation actually takes a lot of energy. You know, for example, when I leave today, I will be really tired. <laughs> I'll be really tired. Um, but um, truthfully, any. Um, leader knows that the most important thing that you can do as a leader is to hire people around you who are much better than you are and to take advantage of that and support their success. Um, so in the area of communications, I really do try to have people around me who are experts in communication and I try to listen to them and pay attention to the advice that they give me because I think they help me do a better job with that. So that's one piece of it. The other thing is um, you know, to take care of myself, and that's hard. And you know, when the anthrax attacks were going on, we didn't. Right. We really didn't take care of ourselves. We had to run a marathon, and we were running it at the pace of a sprint, and we got worn out, and it was really, really, really exhausting. So when the SARS um, outbreak occurred, one of the things we tried to concentrate on was resilience within the organization. And somebody close to me on my team pulled me aside and said, you know, that's all very well and good, but are you setting an example? Are you taking care of yourself? You're here 24 hours a day. And people feel like they can't go home because you're not going home. So it helped me realize that if I'm going to be able to do my job and be dynamic and trustworthy, I'm going to have to set a better example of how we create resilience and capability in an organization. And... Um, so again, people who are around me know me well, know that they can look at me and tell when I'm crabby, and they can tell when I'm tired, and they can tell when I'm in a real bad mood. <laughs> so I've been alerted to the fact that while I think I'm being the same as always, I'm pretty transparent. <laughs> so I try to learn from that too. Well, your passion is a very much part of what keeps you going. Um, can you talk a little bit about, about passion? Because I think that's part of 
getting beyond being an introverted. Yeah, I'm very purposeful, you know. I probably am driven, and that may be that work ethic that, you know, you grow up with in the Dakotas, but, um, you know, passion is energizing, and it probably does. It probably does compensate for some of that internal um, introversion, but um, I'm really passionate about health. Um, not necessarily about health care, but I'm passionate about health and health creation. And I'm just so convinced that we can do a whole lot more to create health in the world. And I've had the privilege of seeing that from several different perspectives now. And, and what happens when you get a group of wise people together and create a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts, really fabulous things can happen. So to be motivated to catalyze that is, I think that is mm -hmm. part, of, part of my passion. I, I agree with you. That that's I mean, you you know that because you're very passionate too. So we have that in common. Yes, and then we'll come out. Yes, oh great. I'm Lester Hartman. I'm a pediatrician and a MPH student here for a year. Probably the oldest one here. Um, you know, <laughs> no. one question I've had. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've had a series of 360s before, and um, one of the interesting things is how do you balance passion with patience? How do I balance, balance? I don't think I do, unfortunately. I'm not very patient. <clears throat> you know, I, I'm patient when I'm in the mindset of mentor, mentee coach, because um, I think that's a really good mindset for supporting the people on your team is to remember they're, they are the performers. You're just there to help get the best performance that you can get out of them as a group. So the mindset of the coach helps me a little bit, but. You know, I, I'm not the easiest person to work with. I have really high standards. I believe things should be done quickly. I'm very fond of saying, come on, folks, we're having more conference calls. People are dying. You know, <laughs> it's really important to maintain that sense of urgency. And so I'm probably not as patient as I should be. Um, I'm certainly not patient with people who aren't doing their best. I, I have a really low tolerance for people who aren't really fully engaged or who aren't really putting forward their best effort. You know, when, uh, when we were talking about Katrina back in, right. the, in the immediate situation, um, we talked a lot about leadership, but we also talked about complacency. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think m my um, tendency is to try to be the accelerator pedal to overcome complacency. And in organizations that are actually doing well and pretty good or great in many areas, it's very easy to get complacent and not stay in that quality improvement or log phase mindset. And when you see that as a leader, you know, you have to kind of own the, the, the requirement to be the accelerator pedal because you have the sense that many people in the organization are the brakes. So that creates that sense of imbalance between patients and, and, and the kind of support that you want to give people. Well, that is where you're impatient. If you see that their lives at risk, you're very, you're very, very impatient. I'm very yeah. impatient. <laughs> I mean, I'm impatient at Merck. I mean, yeah. You know, we have some great vaccines, and when they were made, they were made for the U.S., and now we want to fix them so that they're better suited for the environments where the children have those diseases. Mm -hmm. and. You know, the, the, the process, the pipeline for a vaccine is just so unbelievably mm -hmm. long, I can hardly stand it. Right. So, um, you know, we are doing other things. For example, we have this great um, joint venture in India with the Wellcome Trust. So Merck and Wellcome created a nonprofit entity to try to take some of the, not just Merck vaccines, but anybody's vaccine that isn't ideally um, formulated for the developing world and to try to accelerate the reformulation or the representation into a product that would be more suitable or cheaper or easier to transport or didn't require the cold chain or delivered without syringes, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we try to create an accelerator um, that is um, designed to create a faster ability to get the products to people mm -hmm. who need them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm very impatient. Yeah. Well, that's good. Next question, yes. Hi, I'm Kevin Koo, and I'm an MPH student in the Department of Society, Human Development, and Health. My question is, 
When we talk about leadership development, we often speak of there being two types of people, leaders and managers, and we speak about it as if it's a, a poor dichotomy, uh, that leaders are great and they, they have vision and they have passion and managers focus on the small things. But sometimes when we're dealing with crises or emergencies, it seems like the people who can identify the problem and attack those key issues and mobilize resources are really the people we need. So now that you've served at the highest levels of public health leadership, I wonder, how you see your role as a leader and or a manager and how one successfully transitions to leverage the leadership of both roles? It's a very complicated question. Um, I want to say one thing because I think it's important to think about. One thing is that no matter how we intend government leadership to operate during a crisis, it is almost impossible to avoid the pull of Washington so what I mean by that is, let's say it's a public health emergency of an important scale, say SARS. Um, it's vital to our nation beyond just the public health dimension of it. And so there is an inevitable tendency for the cabinet to get involved or the White House to get involved or the Congress to get involved. So no matter how you want to decentralize the decision making around the emergency response, there's this tremendous pull of people and time and attention to a more centralized focus. And I, I think that's a central right. challenge that uh, in every dimension, the department that has less problem with that is the Pentagon. Um, but that's, that's another story. Um, so we have two choices. Either we can keep trying to do it the way we think it should be done, or we can acknowledge that this is an inevitable consequence of having a federal government and maybe we need to plan that that's part of the way we manage an emergency and count on that. So that's, that's, well, that was something that was hard for me because while I would feel like my intent was to have different teams of people managing what they were experts in and they were certainly better qualified to do that than I was, you know, somebody important in Washington would call up and say, Julie, I need to know this right now. What's the answer? You need this detail. How come you don't have the information? Get it to me right now. And so there was this constant need to feel like I had to stay on top of every tactic or every piece of data as it was emerging. And we got better at that as secretaries matured, cabinet, you know, not, not just health and human services, but cabinets in general. People started recognizing what was their value add and how to distribute their responsibility appropriately in an organization. So um, I don't think I've completely resolved my theories on how this should work better. But what helps me is what I did learn from General Taylor, who is a retired three-star general and one of the best leaders I know who came to CDC to help us with the massive job of pandemic preparedness that we did in a structured way over a three-year period of time by um, planning, exercising, planning, exercising, crawl, walk, run. It was um, built on the model that the Army does use when it's planning a really complicated operation. Now, imagine Department of Defense, CDC. I mean, those are not two cultures that you would normally expect to be working together collaboratively, but we were able to find a third space where kind of the planning and organizational training capabilities of the Army were balanced with CDC's scientific expertise and our own uh, model of operation and support with the states and the communities. And I think um, when I was watching the H1N1 um, pandemic unfold, which, you know, of course I'm biased, but I think CDC did a terrific job with that effort, um, I could see um, that there was a little bit of both going on, and that made me feel like that learning had occurred at an organizational level, and it was a very respectful process. But when you take that approach, you think in terms of strategy, and as I said before, articulating a strategic intent is critical, because if we know what the strategic intent of our pandemic influenza response is, then everybody throughout the system can understand what we're trying to do and would usually be able to figure out what their role was or what they could contribute. But then you need operational plans, and those plans need to be built horizontally, but they have to be executed vertically. Um, and, and then all the little tactics that come up and get managed on a situation-to-situation -situation basis are informed by the overall planning and the strategic intent that you've created. So in that framework, 
leadership and management aren't terms that really come into play. It's kind of what is the strategic intent, what is the operational plan, what is the tactic, and then each individual is simultaneously an executor, um, you know, a manager of something and a leader of something. So the roles kind of lose their their personality in that context. And I'm not saying that's the only way to lead an organization, but I think in a, in a crisis situation it's effective because everything has to happen fast and on the fly. You can't have a lot of conference calls or, you know, long detailed meetings. You have to be able to to respond and improve, learn as you go. So having a framework and experience exercising that plan really helps. Yes. Oh, here we go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Angela Crane. I'm a physician and I'm also in the MPH program at um, Shuda. And um, I'm still working on the, the question, but just in terms of crisis, we. We are in a crisis right now, just with health care and all that's going on. And how would you approach it? Because it seems to me that the whole, uh, you know, cut and spend, you know, if we could just sort of recognize historically that it does not work, but it, it is just the <laughs> tradition. Um, and, you know, as a leader, how would you move beyond that, you know, because it's, it's so deeply entrenched in the system? I'm really glad that you say it's a crisis. And I think nationally we're in a financial crisis, a debt crisis, but our health system is in a crisis as well. And slow crises are a lot harder than fast crises. So I think this is a slow crisis in that sense, and it's experienced differently than if it was a catastrophe occurring all at once. Well, I said that if, for example, all the teenagers who die from drunk driving all died tonight, we would handle the situation completely differently when there's one this week in this community and then one next week in that community. So the psychology of the response is obviously very, very different. Um, I have theories and fantasies about what I wish could happen. Um, I wish that we really could put a premium on health and health creation and that we as a society could reward and incentivize health creation the same way we reward and incentivize disease care. So I think there are some macro conceptual things that are fun to talk about but very difficult to execute or implement at the community level. One is that we need to measure health. We only measure disease. So, you know, how many adolescents have herpes infection or how many people have diabetes or how many people have cardiovascular disease, but we don't ask the inverse question, how many people have none of those things? How many people are really experiencing good health? That measure is very difficult to come by in most communities. And until we start measuring the proportion of healthy people in a holistic way, it's really difficult to see if we're creating more health or less health um, in the communities that we're working in. But I can even imagine ways that you could be rewarded for creating more health. Like let's say in Cambridge um, or you know in Boston, um, it might be hard in Boston because you have like so much <laughs> medical stuff going on here, but um, let's say that the communities um, agreed that there were three or four really important health improvements, like maybe it's child mortality or maybe it's diabetes prevention. There's some small set of things that we really as a community wanted to see improve and we wanted the proportion of people with none of those problems to go up by some fraction. Well then let's say that um, that was measured by the public health department and the doctors and leaders, the medical community here would have better reimbursement rates if the community health improved. Um, let's say that the employers would have lower benefit rates if the community health improved so that you could actually create macro reward systems that were based on a value or a metric that has true long-term meaning and, and value to the society. That's obviously sounds like I live in a Scandinavian country, but um, <laughs> I, I really think it's important to start thinking about that. We are 
we accept the model that health is about disease care. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm speaking to the public health school, you know this is not the way, the way it is, but we are not able at a societal level to come up with solutions that move us off that paradigm in a powerful way into a different framework for health creation. Um, I, I told folks earlier, um, I told your dean that you know, I don't aspire to be a dean of, of anything because I don't think I would be very good at it. But if someone ever asked me to be the dean of a school of health that was um, sort of an amalgamation of public health, medicine, nursing, dentistry, pharmacy, veterinary medicine, etc., cetera, um, where students were holistically trained as health professionals and then went into specialize in their own particular domains, I think we'd have better health because we'd have a much more integrated and holistic approach to it. But you know, so far no one's taken me up on my on my <laughs> offer. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Ann Kim and I'm earning a master's in health policy and management. I have two questions regarding development. The first one is uh, related to degree. When when you're a master's student who's, you know, in, in the early career stages, um, what what level of mentorship should be you should you be looking for, or even sponsorship? Because I mean, <laughs> it would be highly. Uh, I think it'd be less useful for you and for me if we had a mentorship versus somebody who were maybe at the mid-career level. Um, secondly, uh, development with regard to uh, vaccines, antibiotics. Um, a lot of antibiotics are used in um, mass ag, like food. I mean, all the cows that you know are. Growth promoters, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we take care of them in feedlots by giving them a lot of antibiotics, and this has a lot of public health ramifications. Um, if, let's say, um, more and more people were to become um, immune to these antibiotics, um, what sort of development, given that this is a problem and there is a direction that needs to be taken, do you suggest or uh, think? You mean in terms of your career development in this area? Oh, uh, no. no. Just two questions, correct? Yes. Right. Okay, questions. Okay. Just, just, okay, I yeah. understand. Um, let me start with the first question in terms of what kind of mentor. Um, you know, it is helpful to have a mentor who's at your level or ahead of where you are in terms of the career pathway, um, just because that's part of the process of someone who's a little bit wiser, a little bit more objective, and can see where you are and where you want to go. Um, but it shouldn't really think of it in terms of one mentor. Um, you know, I have some mentors I've had my whole life, and you know, they're still very important to me. And then I have other ones that have popped in because I'm in a new job in a new environment for me, and I need mentoring to be successful where I am right now. So I, I would think of it as situational. You know, where are you? Um, if, if you're clear in your own mind what's your goal, usually that will help you um, find the right person to help support you in getting there. Um, and, and when I think of goals I mentioned when I was four, I said I had only one goal, and that was to become a doctor, and so that was more than a five-year plan. But generally speaking, on a personal level, I have a kind of like a five-year cycle that I think through my goals in, and that's probably a pretty good time frame for people who are in school or who are, you know, in the earlier phases of their career because you can get a lot done in five years, but, it, you know, you have to kind of relax a little bit and just say, right now I'm putting tools in my toolbox, and maybe I don't know exactly why I'm having this laboratory experience or why am I taking this biostatistics track, but you'll be surprised down the road how those tools will inform your choices or enhance your capabilities. I had a lab. I was, had an NIH training grant, and I did work on Staph aureus in the lab. And, you know, I really loved it, but I only liked to do the experiment one time. <laughs> then I just, I like the repetition was just, why would we just keep doing this experiment over and over again? Um, so I kind of felt like, why am I doing this? This is just a waste of time. I'm not going to be a laboratory scientist. But I am so glad I had that experience because now I can work around scientists and while I don't pretend to know their science, I can talk to them. I understand the way they think. I understand, you know, some of the scientific framework that they use. And so finding a mentor who might not be directly in your career path but has something that will contribute to the tools in your toolbox, I think that's another way of thinking about it as well. 
With respect to your question about antimicrobial resistance and the broad use of antimicrobials outside of disease treatment in humans, I think there's no question that that's a public health issue. Um, I think the FDA is coming around to be forceful in that in the United States. We've seen successful implementation of policies in, for example, Denmark, where the antibiotics as growth promotants have been taken out of the food supply, and they've seen really no impact on the industry or the profitability in the food industry. So that's just an area of policy that we need to get increasingly forceful with. Hi, Dr. Julie. I'm Ming Yang, first year student in nutrition. Uh, my question is that uh, in the past, you worked in the academic and uh, government. Maybe they are similar because uh, your mission is to protect the health of the public. But now you are in the private uh, company. Mm, it's uh, in the industry. You have uh, an additional responsibility to make, uh, work, uh, make more profit. Yeah. Do you think it is harder for you? And uh, it, do you have any experience that your belief is in conflict with Merkel's belief in your? Yeah, I I, I understand work. your question, and I, it's a, it's something I had to really think about, you know, a lot, um, because I'm pretty much a public health, you know, guru. Um, I work at San Francisco General Hospital, which is taking care of all the people who've missed many opportunities for good health and. Um, uh, you know, it's, it was definitely something I wasn't sure about. I also, as I mentioned before, lived through the experience of not having countermeasures to bioterrorism threats, not having flu vaccine when we needed it, not getting the vaccines that we did have to the children in all parts of the world. So I, I also see the tremendous value that the private sector brings to creating medicines and vaccines that people need. One of the ways that I like to think about it is that these are not mutually exclusive goals. In fact, they're really highly interdependent. Because if Merck is not profitable, you know, we don't make vaccines or medicines. Um, but if we don't put the patient first or the, uh, you know, the, the value that we bring to society first, we don't have the wherewithal to use those profits in good and important ways because we won't have credibility. People won't trust us and we won't be able to you know, to, to, to make the investments that we need. So there are two parts of the equation. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's how the private sector operates. I think what's really interesting and where my learning has come very far this year is understanding the relationship, at least in vaccines, between the volume of vaccines that we use and the price. So the more we use, the lower the price. And that's the way we can get affordable vaccines into Gavi or into the lower middle income markets where people can't afford to pay. But you have to be comfortable with the idea of tiered pricing, which means the people who can afford to pay um, the expensive prices will pay the expensive prices. The people who have some resource and can negotiate that pay uh, less. And the people who can't afford it at all should not have to pay um, anything that would result in a profit to the company. So, you know, that's the way I look at it. Um, and the more we get vaccines to more people, the, it, this is just a simple economic principle. Let's say, you know, we have a factory for making ma vaccines. Once we cover that cost, the cost of the development that and the research that led to the product and the cost of the things that failed to make it, but we still have to pay for it anyway. Any dose of vaccine we make beyond that, we're just making for the variable cost, which is basically the materials and the labor it takes for the, the next dose. So the variable cost is much lower than the fixed cost. And we can try to manage the fixed costs in the developed world markets so that we can use vaccines at the variable costs in the rest of the world. Most manufacturers are following that strategy. And that's, that's how we, we are able to offer vaccines to Gavi at prices that are so far below what we are selling them for elsewhere. We have time for one last question, a quick one. Julia Goldberg. I'm a doctoral student in the Department of Global Health, uh, and I really appreciate what you've said today about the importance of uh, founding our public health efforts in evidence, uh, and I also appreciate what you've said about uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. So as someone who's interested in research, I'm particularly interested in collaborating with practitioners. 
uh, so that we can inform one another's efforts. And I think you have a unique perspective on public-private partnerships. Uh, and I wonder about what advice you have for leadership in interdisciplinary collaborations. Oh, will you invite me back? Again yes. To yes. That conversation? <laughs> sure. um, I, I would love to talk more about that. You know, um, as I said a little bit earlier, horizontal planning, vertical execution is my mental model for how to get complex things done. Because I think when you're in the planning phase, the richer the input and the more um, experience and um, relevance that you have for the affected people, the more likely you are to plan something that will bring the value that you're hoping to achieve. But the ability to do that, there's a high transactional cost for collaboration, meaning you got to develop relationships, you got to understand people who are very different than you are in organizations that are very different. So it takes a long time and a pretty big investment to create that framework. But once you have it, it's priceless. And because once you have that kind of relationship, any new problem that pops up, you can really accelerate a solution. That's what we always say in preparedness. The time to be exchanging business cards is not when the building is burning down. You know, the, the time to do that is when you're learning how to collaborate to fight the fire. So private-public partnerships are absolutely critical, and I think they're tricky. Um, there are a lot of different models. Um, I'm involved in many at CDC been involved in many at Merck. I'm trying to initiate more. And I think that the way of the future is going to be about those collaborative partnerships or that network of influence. Because the problems we have to solve are very complex, multi-stakeholder problems. Um, and if we don't involve the communities in the solutions, we're not going to be successful. So it, it is, and you'll have to give your lecture on meta-leadership, but I think that's basically um, the solution. And, and, and there's a different skill set because you need negotiation skills. You need cultural competence. You need literacy competence in the broadest sense of the term. You need patience. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> First, thanks to all of you. These were some fabulous questions and thank you Absolutely. for bringing your questions and thank you, Julie, um, for sharing your passion. Um, for sharing your thinking on leadership. And um, as, as you were speaking, I was thinking you've been here many times with the inauguration of the NPLI. You were our graduation speaker. And we hope to look forward to other times to welcome Thank you here you. to the School I of Public Health. I hope I can Health. come back. Mm -hmm. Thank you.